Very beautiful. Appreciate that. Courtney? Like I always say, I could do that <laughs> in a million years. I always have to qualify it. It might take a little while for me to do it. And uh, I think you, all of us could probably say that, couldn't we? In a million years, you know, we'll be able to do that. But uh, appreciate the, the talent uh, in, in uh, serving God's people in that way. You know, brethren, the church of God goes forward on its knees through prayer, because all of us, as we pray, as we, we talk to God, we, we're talking about basically the same goal, aren't we? You know, Mr. Armstrong used to ask the question, why are we here? Well, you know, we're all here, hopefully, pursuing the same goal. The goal of the kingdom of God. I mean, is that why you're here, by the way? Is that why you got up this morning? Is that why you pray every day? Is that why you hold to the Word of God? Do you want to find out what pleases God? Because you want to be in the kingdom. You want to be a part of God's family in the future. You know, brethren, God is pleased if we are in unity with regard to the, the pursuit of the kingdom of God. He wants all of his children to be pursuing the same goal of the kingdom of God as, as a family, to work together. You know, if you could imagine, you know, a father, you know, having a, a number of children and wanting to make that family he has, you know, into a cohesive team to accomplish a goal. Even on a physical level, by the way, sometimes families uh, can get a vision of what, what they're trying to accomplish and they could do a lot. Now, there have been many families, uh, as we know, in the United States even. You could probably name a few. Rockefellers would be a family like that. Uh, maybe some would say the Kennedys. Uh, you know, even though we may not necessarily care for the, some of the morality of people, at least they, they all have, it seems like, a goal that they, they're working toward. You know, you could go through a number. The Bush families, another uh, family like that. Well, God has a family, and, and brethren, he wants to work with that family as they pursue the same goals as well. The goal of his kingdom. <coughs> you know, brethren, we have, all of us, or we should, have one faith. One faith. We should have one hope. And the hope of the future, kingdom of God, the world tomorrow, and all that that is going to entail ahead of us. And again, brethren, it pleases God if we're in unity about those things. That we're walking to the same beat of the same drummer, as it were. No, David was a man after God's own heart, and back in Psalm 133, verse 1, he said, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Well, there could be no, nothing greater than brothers and sisters gathering together and enjoying one another's company, not being crossways with each other, but loving each other. And what, what is even greater, brethren, is that, that they all have the same goal. They all have the same desire. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You know, here, Paul says in verse 1, and we'll just go down to verse 6, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. It's like Mr. Willis talking about how can uh, such a small group do such a humongous job of preaching the gospel. Well, brethren, one of the ways that we can do that is if we're all walking worthy of our calling that God has given to us. But notice it says going on, with all lowliness, it says in gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one, one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, endeavoring, working at keeping in unity, in other words, pushing for the same goals. 
It goes on to say there is one body. You know, we're not mul multiple bodies, but we're one body, one spirit, just as you're called into one hope of your calling. We all have the same hope. One Lord, one faith, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Now, there are people today that think that there are many roads to, the, to heaven. You probably have heard that, haven't you, in the churches of the world. There are many, many roads. I mean, well, you can be a Buddhist, you can be a, you know, uh, any other religion. You know, Hindu, and you all end up in heaven. <laughs> now, when you come into the church, you find out that nobody ends up in heaven. <laughs> and we come to see that. But there is a oneness, brethren, about God's people. A oneness of thought, the way we think. A oneness of judgment. And so, brethren, the message uh, that, in fact, we find here in Ephesians 4 is unity, isn't it? Oneness. Oneness of purpose. And we go on to, to read in Ephesians 4 how how that the church's purpose is to equip the saints so that they have a firm foundation. And as the Bible says, no longer as children tossed to and fro and carried about, if you read on down here in Ephesians 4, by every wind of doctrine. Here's this word doctrine, which is like a dirty word to many people, by the way. You know, when you talk about the doctrine of your church, but it says that, that some are carried away by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. And that head, of course, is Jesus Christ. You know, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, remember, there was a, there was a disparity among the people. Some were rooting for Peter, some like Paula, Apollos, and some like Paul. And sort of tongue-in-cheek, uh, you know, uh, Paul said, well, even some of you like Christ. <laughs> but let, let's do this over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It, it's been a while since we've read this particular verse, but we need to be reminded of what the Bible says. But in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 over here, just one verse here, verse 10. Here Paul was writing to, to a very disunified church there in Corinth. And in verse 10 he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. You all speak the th same thing. And there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Let me ask you, brother, does that describe this church here? Are we a cohesive group of people? Are we unified in oneness and purpose? Well, brethren, do we allow you know, the doctrines here and there to influence us and to affect us. You know, are we, brethren, like uh, Ephesian church was, was told, you know, tossed about by every wind of doctrine? You know, the church is called, and we'll read this a little bit later on, it's called the pillar and ground of truth. You want to know the truth, you don't have to go elsewhere. You find it in the church. So it's a pillar and the ground of truth. And I'm going to use this word doctrine, though again it's a dirty word to some people. It's almost like the word Jewish to some people. But sound doctrine, brethren, is vital to our foundation and it's vital to the church. The church has to have sound doctrine. 
Now, if I were to stand up here and try to prove to you the Sabbath, I don't think I'd have many that would debate that. Or if I tried to prove the holy days, or I, I pro, uh, you know, went through and, and proved other things. We wouldn't try, of course. We would do it. So again, doctrine, brethren, sound doctrine is vital to your foundation, and it's vital to the church, both the local church and the church, in fact, worldwide. Let me tell you, brethren, there are many people who have fallen away, backslidden, if, if you're from the south, <laughs> because they lack an understanding of the foundation of truth in their lives. And they are, like the Ephesians were warned, tossed about by every wind of doctrine. You know, there is coming a time where it talks about how people, because they did not receive a love for the truth, that they're going to believe the lie, the very big lie, that's coming. Again, the emergence of that beast power and the false prophet that comes on the scene where the world is going to be swayed. So this message today, brethren, is you and I need to establish a firm foundation of truth, of the doctrine of the church, so that we can be saved from this generation. As the Bible even calls it an evil and a perverse generation. And you know, it is getting more and more perverse as time goes on. <laughs> I just was listening to the news last evening of how that they are, the Supreme Court is going to examine the question of same-sex marriage. Now where that will go, I don't know. But I, I believe uh, the news said that, that 37 states have already accepted same-sex marriage. I wonder, brethren, if this is going to be a watershed event. If, in fact, the Supreme Court allows you know, same-sex marriage across the, the country, if God will say, you know, okay, guys, you're on your own. You know, uh, and from now on, you know, God's protection maybe is off this country. And we begin to see all kinds of bedlam that begins to come on the scene. And maybe that won't happen. I, I don't know. But we'll, we'll have to see what happens. But it, it certainly is, would be a watershed uh, event if the Supreme Court were to approve that from, you know, sea to sea, as they say. But, brother, we need to establish a firm foundation of sound doctrine that we can be saved from this evil and perverse generation. And the Bible uh, warns us to try the spirits. I gave a sermon, I believe, on the subject of trying the spirits some time ago. To try the spirits whether they're of God. Not everybody that says they're of Christ or of God really is. You know, there are two things that we need, two major facets to ensure that we try the spirits and that is number one we know what the truth is <laughs> and number two brethren is we have God's spirit we know what the truth is and we have God's spirit because Jesus when he came in in John 4 verse 23 said that the father seeks those that worship him in spirit and in truth in spirit and in truth. In other words, sound doctrine is very important. Now to worship God in spirit means that we have to have God's spirit, right? <laughs> That's working in us. So the Holy Spirit is vital to true worship. And also the spirit here could mean attitudes, the right attitudes. And to worship in truth, brethren, means to be teaching the truth in the church of God and believing the truth is God's people. So we both worship in spirit and in truth as God's people. And brethren, the truth that we understand within the church of God is, is basically codified in our uh, foundational doctrines. We have, of course, uh, a statement about the foundational doctrines of the church that all of us need to uh, be familiar with. 
And there are many of those doctrines that frankly uh, reveal truth that has been hid since the foundation of the world. Because this world simply has not understood those doctrines, brethren, that you have come to see that most in this world simply do not. I was looking at one of those such doctrines this morning and that is the subject of the Trinity. <laughs> Understanding again that God is not a Trinity. We of course understand also that we don't believe in the immortality of the soul. But we believe in the spirit in man the Bible talks about. Quite different. You know, the spirit in man than the immortality of the soul. So there are foundational doctrines, brethren, in the church that all of us need to know if we're going to be saved from this generation. Now, brethren, what is doctrine anyway? What is it? You know, it's not a dirty word, by the way. It is, a, it is basically uh, a word, though, that can be very volatile in the churches of this world. There have been many splits over the subjects of doctrine. In fact, we went over this in our own experience, didn't we, in 1995. <laughs> when our, when our uh, uh, an associated church went one way and we went, you know, the other way. Uh, we went the way, in fact, we'd always been going, and that is teaching those things which we knew to be true. In the churches of this world, often doctrine is established by tradition and rather than the Bible. Sometimes even uh, doctrine is, is developed from philosophy. <laughs> if you ever study the subject of the Trinity, you will find that much of what is believed about the Trinity comes from, you know, basically uh, philosophy, Plato, and the writings of Plato. And they emanated from the east, eastern part of the Roman Catholic Church. And back in 1995 and prior to that, those philosophies crept into the, the Church of God, by the way, and ended up destroying you know, the, the uh, worldwide Church of God, and I'll just again speak to the name, in 1995. And that's how the United Church of God resulted the word doctrine, by the way, is from the Greek word didash, and I'll spell it for you. It's D-I-D-A-C-E, C-H-E, D-I-D-A-C-H-E. And the word doctrine means the act of teaching what is taught. <laughs> That's all it means, brethren. And for us, it means teaching the truth. It means also accepted uh, learnings and teachings. Now, when Jesus Christ was, was working with the disciples, you know, there was not a book that was developed, uh, obviously, where you could, you could uh, go through all the doctrines. You know, there wasn't a fundamentals of beliefs, in other words. The fundamentals of beliefs that we have are right here. <laughs> this book, <laughs> which is interpreted by many, a hundred different ways. Well, about 1,200 different denominations. And as, as we always tell people, everybody can't be right. They can't be right. There's, there's really only one way. One way of understanding. At least in the major uh, issues. What color car you have, that's a different subject, obviously. But when it comes to uh, true teachings and truth and doctrine, there is only one way. So the word didash means simply teaching. What is the teaching? And when we talk about doctrine, what is the teaching of the church? But when, when Jesus Christ was with the disciples, you know, there was nothing really written down. The Bible came much later, in fact. <laughs> Put together, uh, we believe, by uh, Paul had some manuscripts, and, and John, you know, probably put it all together himself before he died. You know, the, the New Testament, at least, 
And uh, of course the old was already formulated and together. But after Christ, you know, was crucified, then it became necessary to have something that was more uh, hard and, and sure. And of course we have then the scriptures that came about that were inspired by God. But let's go over here to John chapter 7. Now, what was the teaching of Christ? You know, there's a consistency in the Bible. Uh, very, very consistent. Things that we see, themes that we see in the Bible. But in John 7, John 7 and verse uh, 16 and 17 over here. In verse 16 of John 7, it says, And Jesus answered them, he's answering the Jews, and said, My doctrine, here's that word doctrine, in other words, my teaching, Jesus is saying, is not mine. It's not mine. But he who sent me, he who sent me, the Father, and if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. But of course there were people during the time of Christ that never accepted what Jesus Christ taught. Now the disciples did. You know, they accepted it. But it, it says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning his doctrine. The doctrine. Whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He's going to know. And there is something about the truth, brother, when God's Spirit begins to intermingle with our minds, and when you see it, you recognize it. You recognize it. You see it. It is truth. I know that was the way it was with me when God's Spirit really began to work uh, in me, that I, I could see it. It's like it jumped off the page. It's like a light bulb goes off in your head. And finally you see it. it you're illuminated. Chapter 17. Let's go over to chapter 17. In chapter 17, over here uh, in verse uh, 17, here, remember, Christ was praying to the Father. And he said, Sanctify them by your truth. So, brethren, doctrine is very important, or the teachings of God are very important because we are sanctified by the truth. Don't let anybody tell you that doctrine is not important. But all we got to do is believe in Christ. You know, just be good uh, people and we'll go to heaven. This is where usually that kind of fall to all leads. But set them apart, Jesus Christ uh, could have said here in the modern day vernacular, by your truth. And then he said, your word is truth. Remember Pilate said, what is truth? And that's the answer. The word of God is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So here twice we are told that again we are set apart by the truth. Now one thing we find, brethren, about the Bible is you don't have to interpret the Bible. The Bible interprets itself. And one of the problems that, that people have had is, is because they have interpreted the Bible themselves. And they pulled all kinds of things out of the Bible that frankly were never there. But if you start comparing Scripture to Scripture, and you cover, again, what is said within the Bible, you come up with the truth. So the Bible interprets itself by interpreting its own symbols and its own meanings. Now, I mentioned about the beast. The concept of the beast, where does that again, concept come from? Well, we look, uh, of course, back specifically in the book of Daniel, 
And, and a beast, uh, you know, you, of course you read that initially, and you wonder, what, what is this leopard uh, that is described here in the book of Daniel picture? Or what, what is this, this other animal that is, you know, described? And, you know, it really, we come to understand that it, that it pictured world-ruling empires that were fierce in their nature. They dominated the world. And actually, over there, we, three world-ruling empires are identified. Now, it's not my purpose to go through, but we, to show again, the Bible interprets its own symbols. Also, the, 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 the word star we find in scriptures. Here we talk about, it talks about there in Revelation 12 how the tail of, of, of Satan pulled a third of the stars of heaven. Well, what is a star? Revelation 1.20 says a star is an angel. So again, the Bible interprets itself. And we don't have to, again, figure it out. Uh, all we need to do is find out what the Bible says about itself, and then we'll find out what the truth is. I'm going to take a little time here to, brethren, talk to you about sound doctrine and how we can determine sound doctrine from the Bible. How we can come to see sound doctrine from the Bible. Well, like I already pointed out, Jesus Christ said that God seeks those that worship him in spirit and in truth. The number one thing that is important, brethren, to find the truth in the Bible is humility. Humility is the key. Worshiping God in spirit means that our attitude, brethren, is right. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66, over here. Very important verse. Now I mentioned about how that what pleases God is the unity of God's people. But over here in Isaiah 66... In verse 2, notice here. What the prophet Isaiah says. He says, for all these things, God says, my hand is made. And all those things exist. Talking about, again, the creation of the earth and all those things. Says the Lord, says the eternal but on this one will I look, this person I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. Who trembles at, at what I have said. Well, we should not tremble again for, before human beings, but we should tremble before what God says, what God commands as God's people. So, brethren, humility... A contriteness of spirit, a right attitude, is so important. I remember when God began to reveal to me the truth. And I've conveyed this to you before. Uh, how I was reading the Bible and I kept reading it over and over again. We all do this, don't we? To begin with, we read the Bible and it's like, what did it say? You know, I, sometimes you read a book and you'll, you'll be th maybe ten pages down the line and you... You find out you didn't understand a thing that was said in the book. Well, it was that way when I, I read the Bible. It's like I read these scriptures, but it didn't really mean a lot to me. And I do remember, you know, getting uh, into an attitude where I, I said, God, I'm going to understand this. I sort of became very rigid. I was like the German. I will understand this. You know. And it was not really, brethren, until I, I basically prayed to God and I said, God, okay, let me come at it this a different way. <laughs> okay, if you will reveal to me what this book means, I promise you I will do it. <laughs> if you, no matter what it is, you tell me to do it, I will do it. And you know what? Then the light, lights begin to go off in my, my head. 
God had to know, though I was committed to do that. It wasn't a, in other words, it wasn't a fake humility. Uh, yeah, God, you know, let me know what it means and, and I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I really did mean it. So humility, brethren, is a key. If you want to understand the truth. In Isaiah 28, verse 13, you don't have to turn there, but I want to, want to uh, show you well, let's do turn to there, since you're already in chapter 66. It'd be a shame not to go over to uh, chapter 28, just from where you are there. But, but in Isaiah 28, down in verse 13. You know, the Bible, brethren, is written in such a way, uh, yes, it does interpret its own symbols, and it interprets itself, but it is written in such a way that in fact the world at large cannot see the truth. <laughs> because it's spiritually discerned. But in, in uh, Isaiah four, uh, 28 verse 13, let's notice here, it says, The word of the Lord, the word of the eternal, was to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, <laughs> line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. Why is it written this way? Why, why, if you want to know the truth, you know, can't you go, like if you want to know about baptism? <laughs> you know, you go to this segment in the Bible, it says baptism, right here. All you ever want to know about baptism. No, you want to know about baptism? You know, this is it. The whole book. <laughs> you know, it tells you about baptism. You want to know about, you know, eternal life? The whole book tells you about eternal life. You can glean here and there things, tidbits about you know, many things. So it's written that way. But why is it written that way? Let the rest of this verse tell, tells us why. That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. <laughs> Remember what Christ said uh, about those that couldn't understand the parables? He said to the disciples, it's given to you to know the mysteries, but it's not, you know, given to them right now. Of course, that time will come we'll, where it will be given to the world, as we know, according to the, the plan, the loving and beneficent plan of God. So the truth of God, brethren, the, the, the doctrines, the teachings of God are written such that they are spiritually discerned. The Bible, again, interprets itself. And that tr truth is determined by putting, uh, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament together. Not as the churches of the world sometimes some toss out the Old Testament. But it's the whole testament. You might say the old and new together. The testimony of God. God's message to mankind. Another thing that is important, brethren, to understand teaching. Is the teachings and doctrines of the church are not established by one scripture. But it must be determined by... Unless that scripture is absolutely clear. <laughs> you know, I would say, uh, put that codicil on that. And it has to be clear. If it establishes a doctrine, of course. I don't know any doctrine that is established just basic on one scripture, though, in the church that we have. But doctrine, again, uh, must be established by... The, the, the scriptures from cover to cover in the Bible. You come to understand what the truth of God is. And again, number one key, brethren, to understanding sound doctrine is humility. Number two, two number two. You know, doctrinal teachings within the church, we're told in the Bible there's a, a safety in the multitude of counselors. In the church, of course, we have many elders. Uh, 
Back in 1995, many of the elders became what is called the, uh, in, in the church the General Conference of Elders. And many elders, by the way, are needed if we change a doctrinal teaching within the church. Three quarters of the elders would have to agree that a doctrinal teaching is changed in the church. But doctrinal safety, brethren, comes with a multitude of counselors. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3 over here, let's notice this. I encourage you, brethren, to, to look up the word doctrine and go through it. You know, there's, of course, many that talk about false doctrines you know, in the Bible. But much said about the true teachings of the church as well. But Second Peter chapter 3 over here, let's notice verses 1 through 3. Here Peter says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Be reminded, uh, you know, here Peter is saying of what the apostles have said and what the prophets have said. So you have to put it all together. In verse 3 it says, Knowing this verse, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. So scoffers are, are of course, uh, to come in the last days. But you notice here that, that Peter says, be reminded of what the apostles have taught and what the prophets have taught. In other words, brethren, the truth is not conveyed by one person, nor just a few people. It, it involves numerous people. In fact, uh, maybe a further proof of that, I won't go over to Acts chapter 15, but remember when the confrontation over circumcision came about, uh, all of the elders you know, agreed with the change that took place because, of course, we find Paul and, and, and uh, Barnabas being sent out to, you know, basically to give the decree to the churches that they served in the Gentile world. In Acts 15, again, how many elders were there? I don't know. But I know we have felt that, that in Jerusalem there were as many as 60,000 people in the church. So you get kind of figure out how many elders there might have been in, in such a situation. Let's so notice on down here in chapter uh, uh, 1 and verse uh, 20 also. 2 Peter 1 verse 20, knowing this verse that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And he shows again over here going on what he means. For prophecy, he said, never came by the will of men. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we know that the, the Bible that we have in our laps, brethren, God inspired many men. And frankly, the, the things that Jesus Christ came proclaiming had been uh, talked about since the foundation of the world by the prophets, you know, who would earnestly desire to look into the things that, in fact, the church came to know and came to understand. So there is doctrinal safety in the multitude of counselors, not well, just one, but a multitude. Uh, chapter 3 over here. Chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, once again. 2 Timothy. I guess we haven't gone to Timothy yet, so that not once again, but 2 Timothy 3 here in verse uh, 13. Let's notice here what Paul was telling Timothy in verse 13. It says, but evil men and impostors will go worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But what did God, through Paul, tell 
Timothy. Verse 14, but you must continue in the things which you've learned, it says, and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And then he, he shows in verse 15 that he knew these things, you know, from boyhood. And he learned about salvation from the Holy Scriptures. The only scriptures he had at the time were the Old Testament, too, by the way. And I'm sure some of the letters of Paul that would, would clarify some of these things. Chapter uh, 3 on down here to verse uh, 16. Here where uh, Timothy's told, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for teaching. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, so that a man can live in this life and live a godly uh, way of life uh, in the course of, of going about doing the works of God. And we know, I'm not going to go to John 6, 44, that the Father himself handpicks those that are called uh, to the church. The Father draws us to Christ, and Christ said, I will raise him up in the last day. You know, the Bible, again, it was, was a collaborative effort. It was a collaborative effort. And within the United Church of God, you know, the ministry and, and the, the membership works in a collaborative uh, effort to prepare a people and to preach the gospel. Of course, there is a process. You know, of, we have, of course, a doctoral committee. If somebody has a, a doctoral position, you know, that they would like to uh, write something up, uh, then it, is, it goes through a, a procedure. And like I say, if it is a change in the doctrine of the church, you know, there must be agreement among the elders. But, you know, it's important for us to understand, too, brethren, with all of the doctrines uh, that the church has, and with the, the teachings that are, that are within the scriptures that we see that very clearly, uh, you know, are, are brought out, even so, we all need guides. You know, we, we can't go it alone. Oh, no man is an island, as they say. Let's go over to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. You may be the most brilliant person that ever walked the face of the earth. And, you know, I hope you are. Of course, we need to talk then about uh, humility, don't we? <laughs> but, but uh, you know, here in Acts chapter 8... <clears throat> In verse 30, there was an individual that was very uh, much like you and I when we began to study the scriptures. We read and we say, well, I wonder what that means. But God miraculously sent someone to help him. <laughs> but here in verse 30, let's notice again. Well, Philip ran uh, to this, this Ethiopian eunuch, remember, who was a treasurer uh, for uh, Queen uh, Candace. And, and notice in verse 31, uh, verse, verse 30, Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He may have been reading Isaiah 53, by the way. And said, do you understand what you're reading? Often people don't. And he said this, and this is inspired to put in your book that you have on your lap. How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. And the place in which he read was, was again, Isaiah 53, where it talked about the crucifixion of Christ. And so Philip went up and... and uh, Apparently, uh, talked to the man, talked to him about many things. It wasn't just about that, but many things. And later, you know, it happened along the way, he was able to baptize well, this individual. But the Ethiopian eunuch needed a guide. 
When Cornelius was called, he needed a guide. Remember, Peter went to talk to Cornelius. You know, the brethren of, up in the, of the Samaritans needed, you know, a guide. Philip, of course, was there as well. But always, by the way, when there's a, a guide, somebody to lead somebody in the right way, you ever notice that there's always somebody else that is there to lead the wrong way? <laughs> and when Philip went up there to the Sumerians to teach them, and many people were converted, you know, there was Simon Magus right there <laughs> who was looking for an opportunity. And some say that he established his church in 33 A.D. You can carry that out for a little bit more study if you want to. Uh, what, what that means, what that entails. By the way, the true church began in 31 AD. <laughs> that gives you any clue. But uh, Philip was necessary to guide the Ethiopian eunuch. Let's go over to, to Romans 6. Romans 6 over here. Romans chapter 6 over here. In verse uh, 16 and 17. He says, do you not know that in, to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slaves whom you obey. I'm sorry, did I read that right? You are the one slave whom you obey. That's, it's written a little differently here in the New King James. Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of men, of sin... Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You get that, brethren? The form of doctrine. It's like the form of doctrine. How many times were we told when we came to see some of the truths of God that it's like a, a, a picture that's being painted? It's a form of doctrine. You can see a picture. And it begins to be filled in by the truth that we learn, that we grasp, that we understand. But here, you know, in this case, Paul is saying that they understood and obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that was given to them. And of course, that form of doctrine didn't come just because of Paul. It became because... Of, of multiple individuals and uh, so that doctrinal safety again uh, is in a multitude of counselors like the Bible says. Number three, number three, number one humility is a key, number two doctrinal safety uh, is in the multitude of counselors and number three the church's foundation brethren is the prophets and the apostles and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of all doctrine, of all teachings within the church. For, uh, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, over here. Ephesians 2. In verse 19. Now therefore, he says, you're no longer strangers and foreigners... But fellow citizens were the saints and members of the household of God, having, built, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitly framed together, grows into a temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God, it says, in the Spirit. Well, God is building a, a spiritual temple, as we see from this. But the foundation of it all, the foundational teachings, brethren, come from the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to go over to this verse, but in Acts 2, verse 42, you'll notice that the church uh, at that time, of course, they were all from various parts you know, of the Roman world had come together for Pentecost, and, you know, while they were there, many of them became 
converted, they were baptized, and many, multiple thousands were added to the church. And they shared things with one another, because otherwise those that had traveled from a long distance would not have been able to survive. And it, it says that they continued in the apostles' doctrine, the apostles' teachings. Not apostle, by the way. Not Peter. As, of course, uh, one religion says he was the first, first uh, papa, the first pope. But in the apostles' doctrine. And so, brethren, the church's foundation is the prophets and the apostles and Jesus Christ. Number four, brethren. Number four. And this, brethren, is, is really a very important point here. And I just encourage you to make a study of this. Maybe even today to make a study of this when you get home. Christianity, brethren, and the teachings of the church are a way of life. It's a way of life. And Jesus Christ came to mirror that way of life for us. Over here in Acts uh, 18, Acts ch chapter 18, over here. And there are many, many scriptures like this, brethren, you can go to, and I, I won't take the time to, to go through all of them, but you could do a whole sermon, in fact, on the subject of how, through the Bible, in the New Testament, it talks about this way of life. And what, what again, we mentioned earlier that they obeyed, the, the brethren that were there that had submitted to God, obeyed the form of doctrine, the form of teachings. They lived it, in other words. But, but uh, Acts 18, in verse 25 and 26, it says, And this man, talking about Apollos, had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So Apollos baptized uh, by John or one of his disciples. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogues. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. <laughs> you know, to fine-tune what he understood. Sometimes when Christ would talk to uh, some, he would say, you're not far from the kingdom. <laughs> They're not too far away. So, you know, they had to take Apollos aside. And frankly, all of us have to be taken aside, as it were, to be taught. <laughs> the way. The way of God. The form of doctrine. The understanding that we should have. And humility, again, is a very important uh, aspect of, of brethren coming to see these things. You know, the Apostle Paul himself said this to the Corinthians. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So Christ came to mirror the way. And Paul himself was, was trying to imitate Christ as we should try to imitate Christ. We can use Paul's writings. Also, brethren, the Bible tells us that the scripture cannot be broken. This book cannot be broken. I don't know how many times, uh, you know, there have been some that have said, well, you know, the Bible's wrong about this archaeologically. <laughs> and, you know, nearly every time they, they've done that, they've, later it's come out that, well, you know, we discover, discovered under this tell, uh, you know, in Israel, you know, after all, the Bible might be right. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they don't believe what the Bible says, uh, you know, and the other aspects. But the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus himself said that, John 10, verse 35. In fact, Jesus himself said, Brethren, assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until everything is fulfilled. Look around you, brethren. Well, I saw the sky when I came down here. 
today, everything's still here. So the book is still here, isn't it? The scripture cannot be broken. Number six. Well, Paul's advice, brethren, for, for the men like Titus and Timothy are good enough for us, should be good enough for us today. Let's go over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus 2. He says in verse 1, But as for you, speak the things which are proper, he said, for sound doctrine. That the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, and love and patience. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. So you can, you can go through all of this, brethren. And, you know, God is instructing here Titus through what Paul says to him. And, you know, basically, you know, he's telling him how to pastor a church. But again, what was good enough for Titus should be good enough for you and me, shouldn't it? We should talk about those things that make for sound doctrine. <laughs> and Jesus Christ talked about, yet let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, the Bible's just outdated, archaic. That was the first century. In fact, in 1995, prior to that, they were talking about, well, you know, this, these views about women not preaching in the church, that was first century. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that former association now is ordaining women as elders within the church. <laughs> but, you know, Paul gave it the advice. Teach that which is sound doctrine. And we know that Jesus Christ, we're told in Hebrews 13, verse 8, is the same today, yesterday, and forever. God doesn't change from one generation to another. You know, we know that he teaches the same. <laughs> you know, we may not necessarily go camp out in the wilderness of, of you know, of, uh, you know, as they did in ancient Israel time. <laughs> uh, there's a modern day approach to some things, but, but again, the way of life doesn't change. The way of living does not change. Number seven, number seven. All members must see the importance of having un the unity of faith and hope and doctrine within the church. All members need to see that. Again, we are one body, one faith, one spirit. We go through uh, 1 Corinthians 12, I mean, it, the word one is used a number of times. So God wants us to get the message that he's pleased with unity. That we all speak the same thing. And when, when God was, was telling uh, Titus, and you're right there in Titus, let's notice in, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 7, he told Titus, he says, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, again, having a humility, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover good of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, and self-controlled. But notice verse 9 here. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So, brethren, that is what is good enough for you and me, all of us, brethren, within the church. And we are grounded in sound doctrine. that we can convict the gainsayer. And both Timothy and Titus were told to, to do this, in fact. 
And as I mentioned to you, brethren, there is a form of doctrine and teaching the church of God has. We need to be very acquainted with that. Uh, you know, and ministers of, of the church were told time and again in the scriptures to teach what you have been taught. In fact, uh, you know, Paul, uh, you know, admonished, he said, the things that you've heard me say before multiple witnesses, that is what you should teach. Well, no, nothing, you know, uh, private uh, type thing, but before everybody, that's what you ought to be teaching. And, you know, one of the keys, brethren, of conversion is, again, humility. Do we tremble at the word of God? And, you know, I'm not going to go to 2 John uh, 1, verse 10, but one of the things that, that, you know, Paul, or John, I should say, admonished the church, and probably he was in his 90s when he was doing this, maybe about 90, 95 AD, around there. He says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine... He says, do not receive him in your house, nor greet him. Now, you can read it, the scripture yourself. Over there in 2 John 1, verse 10. Rather than the ultimate goal of one doctrine and one faith and one hope is the kingdom of God. And God desires we all be in unity. You know, but by the time that Jude wrote what he wrote in Jude uh, 1, verse 3 through 4, he says this. He said, Beloved, when I give, gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. See, the common salvation of the church. Not many ways to salvation, but the common sa salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend the Greek word, by the way, uh, for contend is struggle for. Struggle for. Earnestly contend for the faith. The word uh, faith here in the Greek is persuasion, conviction, and truth. You know, contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So brethren, I hope that by talking about these things with you here today that you and I will strive to, to do as Paul admonish the Corinthian brethren to do, to speak the same things. To come to see what are the teachings of the church, first and foremost, and that we speak the same thing. And brethren, if we adhere to the same doctrine, we will have the same belief, we will have the same judgment. <laughs> and we'll have the same faith, and we'll have the same hope, and we'll have the same end, which will be to be in God's wonderful kingdom. So again, let's be one in faith, one in hope, and one in doctrine as God's people.